She was talking about Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, in case you couldn't hear. And it talked about Jesus and how he endured the shame for us. He, did, he despised the shame, but he endured it. He endured the cross because it was the will of the Father. Amen. And that there's, that there's better to come. He knew. He knew what he was enduring it for. It was for the glory that was going to be received. And it was for the purpose of bringing healing to us. Amen. Amen. And that sometimes we're going through things. And, you know, to transition into this message, I can tell you that right now in my own personal life, I'm going through some things. Some of you, you know, may know a little bit about it. But one of the things that's interesting to me is that. This message was really completed about three days ago. Don't get me wrong, I, I tweaked a little intro stuff, but the, but the points were already written three days ago, and it's, and it's not important what we're going through, because it really and truly, it's, it's relevant for all of our lives, because it's the things that all of God's people go through, and it's the word of the living God. But it just never ceases to amaze me how God is already there, He's already on time. No, no I'm sorry, He's not on, just on time, He's He's in advance. He's in advance preparing a way, orchestrating events, allowing circumstances to take place in order that he might accomplish his will in our lives. Now listen to me. Sometimes that process doesn't feel real good when you're going through it. And that was the story where we were last week. We were we were in First Chronicles. And you don't have to really go there right now, but we were in First Chronicles chapter 21. But but a similar version of the story was out of Second Samuel. And one of the big points that I made last week is is that if you look at those two verses of Scripture, it's telling the same story about David. But it's coming from two different angles. Because in one of them it says that Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Israel. And then the other one, it says, and again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel and he moved David against them to go and number Israel and Judah. And so the question is, who was behind it? Was it God or was it the devil? And the point that we made was, is that it was both. Because God allows the enemy a certain amount. You may not like this, but I'm telling you right now, this is good theology. This is the word of the Lord. See, God allows Satan a certain amount of liberty in the life of the believer. Well, a preacher, that just doesn't sound right. Well, then you didn't read the book of Job. See, because in the book of Job, Satan has permission to destroy Job's life. God said, you can go this far, but you can't go this far. And then now when that wasn't good enough, the enemy came back again because listen, he's the accuser of the brethren. The word of God says in the book of Revelation that he accuses the brethren day and night. But I got good news because one day he's going to be kicked out of heaven. Hallelujah. And he won't be accusing the brethren anymore. But until that day, you need to understand something. God allows the enemy a certain amount of leeway to provide a test in our lives. To provide a test in our lives. And you know why? Because your faith is more precious than gold. Listen to me, child of God. See, gold on the earth has purchase power, but in the economy of the heaven, faith moves the hand of God. And you can't just say I'm a Christian. No, God is going to allow your faith to be tested. Amen. Because he wants your faith to be tried by the trial, just like fire tries gold. And when you put gold in the fire, guess what happens? The dross rises to the top. What is dross? Impurities. See, there's impurity in gold. You wouldn't even know that it's there until you heated it up with the fire. And then when it melts and it gets to a certain melting point, guess what happens? Bloop, bloop. Bloop, bloop. All of those impurities start rising to the top. Listen to me, child. Whenever the Lord allows a trial to take place in your life, when he allows the fiery trial to start to happen in your life, guess what happens? Bloop, bloop. Bloop, bloop. All the impurities in your own heart start to rise to the top. That's what God is trying to do here. He's trying to reveal to you and I the things that are in our life and the ways that we have gone wrong. Don't punch your neighbor in the arm right now because God's speaking to you. Amen. God's speaking to the preachers like, I knew that's why we were going through stuff. It's because of you. It's because, no, 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 no. Hold on. No. Don't do it, child of God. Don't blame your partner. Don't blame your best friend. Look at yourself in the mirror. The preacher needs to look at himself in the mirror each and every day and come to the real end. Because the quicker we work with the Lord, Amen. the quicker the work of the Lord is going to work. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So last week we made, we covered part one and I titled that, Make a Choice. Because you see, that's what happened. King David made a choice. 
And really, what the issue is, is here, because I made the comment, well, what's the big deal? Isn't it good for a king to know how many soldiers he has? The problem was the motive of his heart. Remember when I said that? It wasn't so much that numbering the people was wrong. It was the motive behind it. David was trusting in the numbers of his army instead of trusting in the hand of God. See, when you and I begin to look at external circumstances in our situation and we begin to look at look at the circumstances and we're like, oh, Lord, I'm never going to be able to get through this. That's a lack of faith. We're not trusting God. We're not looking as though God is bigger than our problem. What happens is our problem becomes bigger than our God. That's not the will of the Lord. That's contrary to. To the word of God. And so what we learned is that every trial is a test of the faith. And every test both God and Satan have an intended result. Right? Mm -hmm. Satan wants to destroy you and God wants to heal you. Yeah. And make you stronger in the faith. And God allows Satan a certain amount of latitude. To allow these things to take place. Right? And the essence of that story though is about this. The struggle of faith. And this is the question. Will I trust God or will I make my own path? Mm. Come on now. Oh, no, you got to ponder on that. See, David, the psalmist would have said, Selah. Stop for a moment and think about that. Will we trust God in the midst of the situation or will we make our own path? See, when I make my own path, when I take matters into my own hands and I manipulate the situation for my good, I open a door of chaos and confusion into my life. But when I trust God, I humble myself. See, that's a big part of this. Humility to trust God. Pride says, I'm going to fix it. Pride says, I'm going to get it done. But humility says, I can't get it done. And I have to trust in the hand of my God to do it for me. If that doesn't sound good to you, child of God, then you're still contrary <laughs> to the will and to the word of God. Well, I thought God helps those who help themselves. That's not even in the Bible. <laughs> I mean, yeah, he wants you to wake up and he wants you to go to work and he wants you to get something done. You, you know, he who doesn't work is work worse than an infidel. But no, that's not the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is that we would humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and that we would trust him to get us through, that he would be our source and our strength. Amen. And when we learn to trust in him, I'm telling you, he'll begin to move. Right. See, I acknowledge to him that I am weak. And I cannot accomplish in my own strength what needs to be done. And I acknowledge that I need his help. In addition, I come to him believing that he will take care of me and work for me because I have done what he asked me to do. Oh, really? Well, what did he ask me to do? Wouldn't you, shouldn't you ask that question? What did he ask me to do, preacher? I'm going to tell you what he asked you to do. He asked me to believe his story. You know, it was interesting, that big old church across the street over there, I noticed on their little marquee thing, it said, don't mess with his story. That is a good little word, man. That's what the Lord told me. The Lord speaks to me a little bit different, I guess, than he speaks to that preacher across the street. Lord, bless him, because that's a good word. What the Lord told me was, keep your grubby fingers out of my word. Amen. <laughs> don't mess with his story, child of God. Don't mess with his story, preacher. It's his story, and he wants it proclaimed the way that he wrote it. I had a conversation with an old boy at the gym this morning he's a believer and you know I started telling him some stuff that I felt like about yeah, I'm going to just say it man he, he started telling me about this group that he likes and you know I know I'm a contrary I, I guess I'm a confrontational dude I don't do it on purpose man I promise you I want people to like me I want to be your friend man I really do because I don't like people to dislike me but at the same time when something just don't sit right with me I'm going to say it he said, man, I knew this Christian group, and it was called Seventh-day Slumber. And it was kind of like a rock Christian group. No, don't even get me started on that. You just do what you want with that. I'm not here to preach on that, but I'm telling you right now, Lord, that, them two things don't go together. Right. Rock and roll and Christian, whatever. Just let's save that for another day. But I started thinking as I was sitting there lifting my weight, Seventh-day Slumber, there's something wrong with that. See, because the seventh day is the day of rest. God said you shall rest on the seventh day, but rest doesn't mean sleep. No, as a matter of fact, rest is ultimately fulfilled in Christ. The scripture teaches us in the New Testament that Jesus is our rest. But to slumber, the apostle Paul warned against that. 
Don't be falling asleep on the job. Don't be like the disciples in Gethsemane. No, sleep and rest are two different things. To be rest is to be awakened, to be watchful, but to be operating in the presence of the Lord. He's like, boy, you sure are breaking it down. You're getting kind of deep. You're going to find the devil behind every bush. I'm like, yeah, I'm here to tell you because the devil is behind every bush. Come on, and he's good. a deceiver of the brethren. And he will disguise himself as a Christian. And us little Christians are so naive. We're just over here sucking lollipops. We're like, oh, Alice Cooper got saved. No, Alice Cooper ain't got saved. As a matter of fact, he's on an interview laughing about the fact that Christians are naive. Alice Cooper didn't get saved. And as far as the rest of them, including that dude that says he got saved the other day, I ain't going to say his name because y'all going to hate me. But why does his cover still look like a pyramid? Come on, somebody. That's the Illuminati. You don't even get no, I didn't even, This ain't part of my message. I'm just here to tell you. That, that seventh day ain't got nothing to do with slumber. Seventh day got everything to do with resting in Christ and trusting Jesus. Anyway, Amen. another story for another time. Amen. Amen. What did he ask me to do? He asked me to believe his story. The story that says that all men born of Adam were born in sin and separated from his presence. And listen to this. Separated from his presence, there is no good in them. I'm talking about us, Amen. church. There's no good in us. Separated from God's presence, there's no good in us. Oh, but we'll buy the lie. Oh, I'm good. I'm not like other men. I haven't stolen. I haven't cheated. Oh, whatever. I haven't lied. Yeah, you have. You've lied. You've, and if you didn't, you thought bad stuff in your head you weren't supposed to think. But you gauge your holiness based on what you see in other people's lives. The Lord said that's relative righteousness. He said two men, this isn't in my message, but I'm just going to tell you. Two men went down to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. He said, I thank God that I'm not like other men like this tax collector over here. I pay tithes on all that I have. And the tax collector wouldn't even look up to heaven. And he beat his chest and he said, Lord, forgive me, a sinner. And Jesus said, who do you think went home forgiven that day? God's, you're, God will not be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he reap. God knows the, hearts and, the heart and the intent that's there. So that's the story that, that you believed. That's what you did. See, because it was separated from his presence, there's no good in us. But God wrote a prescription for this disease known as sin. And the prescription was Jesus dying on the cross and our faith in believing that is like the act of taking the medicine and us taking the medicine through faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for us at the cross makes us clean in the eyes of the Father, removes our stain of guilt and sin and allows a flow of grace into our lives that begins to slowly eradicate the disease that we had received when we were born as Adam's child and now we're born born again in Jesus. It's like taking your medicine every day, putting faith in Jesus and what he did for you at the cross opens up the door for grace to flow into your life. Amen. Amen. Second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Doesn't that seem simple? It really is. It's a very simple message, but it, must also be understood that when we take that wrong step of flesh instead of faith, it produces a result in the equation. And there, listen, this is important. There is a period of time where the repercussions of that decision become part of our lives. And in those times, we are tested all over again. So you came to the Lord, but yet you still made a choice in the flesh. And so what the heart would say is, but I don't want to be in this mess anymore. I don't want this to happen anymore. And almost, I'm not trying to be rude, because if this is what you look like sometimes, I know I look like this sometimes. I don't want this to keep on going like a little small brat. I don't want to throw a temper tantrum. Get me out of this, God. Get me out of it right now. Oh, no, you in it, brother. You open up the door, and I'll say whenever I'm going to close the door. Because, see, I'm God, and you're, you're, you're the child. I'm the potter. You're the clay. And you're going to be molded. And you're going to tell me when to put, take my foot off the wheel and to, right. to make it slow down or when to spend a little bit less. No, you're going to trust me, and you're going to learn to trust me through it all. Amen? That's right. Amen. And that's what 
that's what I started to title my message this morning. Will you trust me even when it hurts? Will you trust him even when it hurts, child of God? Then I wanted to change the title, but I just I forgot to change it, so that's the title, right? <laughs> Will you trust me even when it hurts? But I wanted to title it, and you're going to see why in a second, because I'm about to read it. When God puts the sword back in the sheath. See, the sword represents judgment. We're about to read the story. Where we were in the story, if you will remember, that's what we're going to pick up, is that David had counted Israel. His general Job said, don't you do it. Don't do it. God is more powerful. He can make your men more mighty than the ones that you have. Why do you want to do this thing, king? You're going to be a reproach. But it says the word of the king prevailed. And because of it, God said judgment is coming on the land. And that's where we pick up the rest of our story with David. God offered three choices. The first one was famine. Do you know that when you open up a door to sin, that there's a good likelihood that famine will follow? I'm talking about you will have holes in your pocket many yeah, times. You, you want, you, it don't matter how hard you work, sometimes you're going to find out you can't keep up. You got more, you got more month than money. I mean, you could be making good money and you're like, goodness gracious, where's it all going? Still ain't got enough money, right? And let me tell you something, because when you open up a door, you don't realize it, but many times a spiritual famine can take place. And if it's not financial, it can be spiritual, right? Number two, an attack from their enemies. So God's given them a choice. You want famine or you want an attack from your enemies? Mm -hmm. See, whenever you open up that door of sin, guess what happens? You also give permission to the enemy. That's Ephesians. It says, don't give the devil a foothold. It means don't open up a door and let him in. But many times, that's what we do anyway. We make our own choice. We go our own way and we open up that door. But point, this is number three, God's judgment or correction in their lives. You know what David chose? David chose God's correction. He said, I just know God. I've been walking with him too long. I know I made some mistakes. I know I went the wrong way. No, no, let's not even call it what it is. It it wasn't a mistake. It was sin. I sinned against the Lord and I've opened up a door. But there's one thing that I know about God because I've been walking with him long enough to have learned this. God is merciful and he loves me and he knows what's best for me. I don't want to put my hand in the midst of famine because we might starve to death. I don't want to put my hand in the midst of my enemy because he will destroy us and ravage us. I'm going to put my hand in the hands of the Lord and I'm going to trust upon his mercy. And so here we are. Verse 14. We're in, uh, it was, what was it, First Chronicles 21? <coughs> Let's go to First Chronicles 21, starting in verse 14, and make sure we got the right one here. Yes, so the Lord. Here we go. You ready? So this is what the Lord did. He sent a pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel 70,000 men, and God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord beheld and he repented him of the evil. What does that mean? It means that God changed his mind and said to the angel that destroyed, it is enough. Now stay your hand. In other words, stop what you're doing. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more, but the threshing floor is a place of separation. He stood by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and the heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. The sword of the Lord represents judgment. Then David and the elders of Israel who were clothed in sackcloth fell upon their faces And David said unto God, Is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. I didn't even put this in my message. This is free for you right here. You know what he's doing? He's acknowledging his own sin. And he's not making excuses. For true repentance to take place, you're going to have to quit blaming everybody else. Come on, child of God. we got to learn how to take responsibility for our own failures and our own actions. 
conscience and we got to come clean with the Lord. You ain't got to come talk to me. I'll give you my phone number if that's what you feel like you need, but I can't help you. Right. Jesus, hallelujah, I can lead you in the right direction, but Jesus is the only one that can help you. You got to quit blaming everybody else. Hallelujah, help us, Lord. Yes, Lord. But as far as these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray you, O Lord, my God, be on me and on my father's house, but not on your people, that they should be plagued. Then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and set up an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David went up at the saying of Gad, which he spoke in the name of the Lord, and Ornan turned back and saw the angel and his four sons with him hid themselves. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. And as David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went out of the threshing floor and bowed himself to David with his face to the ground. Then David said to Ornan, grant me the place of this threshing floor that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord that you shall grant it me for the full price. In other words, I want to buy your threshing floor, Ornan, for full price. I'm not asking you to give me nothing. I want to pay for it. That the people, that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Ornan said unto David, take it to yourself and let my Lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. Lo, I give you the oxen also for burnt offerings and the threshing instruments for wood and the wheat for the meat offering, I give it all. And, the, and King David said to Ornan, No, but I will verily buy it for the full price, for I will not take that which is yours for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings without cost. See, someone else can't be sorrowful for you. True repentance requires personal sorrow over sin. And let me tell you something. True repentance costs something. You're not going to buy your way out of this deal. Don't get that out of this message. No, it costs Jesus everything. Jesus already gave his life. He already paid the purchase price. It was the shedding of his blood, the giving of his sinless life to pay the penalty for the sin of mankind. Amen. So David gave to Ornan the place for the place, 600 shekels of gold by weight. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called upon the Lord, and he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of burnt offering. And the Lord commanded the angel, and he put up his sword again into the sheath thereof. Hmm. This is point number one. You ready? It's kind of a long point, but it's a good point. Stop, take a breath, and think for a minute, because he is more than capable to fix this. I want to say it again. Stop and take a breath. Wait and think just for a moment. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, no matter how bad, no matter how much trial and tribulation, no matter how much of a mess it is that you're in the midst of, stop, take a breath, and think for a minute because I'm here to tell you, child of God, that he is more than capable to fix your situation. Hallelujah. And in this story, David, he removed the situation from the capable hands of God and he took matters into his own hands, resulting in chaos. And Job answered, the Lord make his people. Look at this. This is verse number three. We're going backwards a little bit. First Chronicles 21, verse three. Joab answered the Lord. So, so whenever David wanted him to count, Joab answered and he called him the Lord. He's talking about his king, though. He's talking to David. He said, I'm sorry, he's talking about the Lord. The Lord make his people, talking about the king's people, a hundred times so many more as they be. But my Lord, the king, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then does my Lord require this thing? Why will he, the king, be a cause of trespass or sin to Israel? Nevertheless, the king's word Pre prevailed against Joab. What he was trying to say was, is that you might have 1,100,050 soldiers, but the Lord your God make 
takes them like a hundred times what you have. The power in God's hand is greater than what you see. Why are you trying to limit the hand of your God, King? You're going to be a reproach on Israel because you're trying to trust in your own strength instead of trusting in the strength of the Lord. Yeah. Joab, the general, recognized what David was doing. He was taking matters into his own hands and he was looking to his own strength instead of waiting patiently. And when we do this, we invite trouble because we're dismissing God from the situation and attempting to handle it in our own strength and wisdom. But God is more than capable. It's the power of God that makes our army strong. He can make our money go farther. He can give us favor with people even if they don't like us. He can do things for us that we can't do for ourselves if we would just trust Him and wait on His time. When we start stressing, when we start second guessing, and we start trying to move and manipulate and operate, trying to figure it out, and we just make a big old mess. Yes. Ephesians 3.20 says this. Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Amen. See, this scripture describes the fact that God is already positioned to do more for us than what we could have asked for or even thought of. He knows what we need before we ask. He knows what needs to be done to get the job done, but will we let him do it for us? Amen. 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 Psalm 46, 1 and 3. Psalm 46, 1 and 3 says this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear. We were not going to fear. Though the earth be removed, Though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. The psalmist says, stop and think about this. The earth might start quaking. Listen to me. We don't have too many earthquakes to worry about in South Louisiana, thank God. We got enough with the hurricane. <laughs> but what I'm trying to tell you is, is that even when the earthquakes and even when the floodwaters rise and people find themselves in these untoward circumstances, the people of God still have a God that is sitting on a throne and he's more powerful than their situation and circumstance. So no matter what we're going through, God is able to get us through. Amen. No matter what we're first facing, amen, we, he is there to help us in our time of need. Amen. That was point number one. Stop and take a breath. Think for a moment. Amen. This is point number two. You ready? Your sin affects other people. Let me say that one more time. Your sin affects other people. Look at 1 Chronicles 21 verse 17. And David said unto God, Is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray thee, O Lord my God, be on me and on my father's house, but not on your people, that they should be plagued. One of the things that I have noticed through the years is that when a person is comfortable in their sin, they will make excuses to protect their sin and ignore the fact that they are affecting the people that are closest to them. <clears throat> I've told this story before, but when I was 15 years old, I stole my dad's car with two other dudes from Houston and we ran all the way to Los Angeles. And it really hasn't even hit me until recently the effect that I had on my dad at that moment. Not just my dad, but my whole family. Right, right. See, I was thinking about the fallout of that the other day. I was thinking about the frustration that I caused with that one act of rebellion. See, my dad had to fly his brother all the way from Baton Rouge to Los Angeles. Then they had to find which Safeway supermarket the car was in. Then he had to spend at least two days on the road coming back. In addition to that, my sister Linda was getting married, so I completely missed her wedding. And when I think back about the trouble I caused others in my life, it saddens my heart. But if I'm truthful, when it was happening, I didn't care about anything but my sin. I was going to do what I wanted to do, and no one else was going to stop me. It's very important that we understand that the sin of other people will also have a repercussion in our life. Their choices can affect us. Yeah. Lack of peace, lack of sleep, financial problems, added stress, 
David's decision brought a plague on Israel. And listen, here's another Bible example. Jonah's rebellion against God is another biblical example. His rebellion affected the sailors on the boat. They all nearly lost their lives. Look at Jonah chapter 1 verses 4 through 12. It says, but the Lord, Jonah 1, 4 through 12. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was likely to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid, and they cried every man unto his own God. And they cast forth the wares that were in the ship, meaning all of the produce, all of the things that they were delivering into the sea to lighten it, so that it'd be, the ship would be a little more buoyant, right? To lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the sides of the ship, and there he was laying down, and he was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said, Everyone to his fellow, come and let us cast lots. That's what they did back in the day. Throw some dice, try to figure out what in the world is going on. Well, just as God... Let me tell you something. You think stuff happens by accident? No. When somebody just accidentally drives by somewhere and something is seen and something that, no, that, none of that was accidental. God orchestrated that whole thing because he ready to expose something. If you think that God, that they just happened to throw the dice and it landed on Jonah out of all them people, no. God let the light land on Jonah because God was chasing down Jonah and wanting to get a hold of him and wanting to do something in his life. Because he was in an act of rebellion against the Holy One of Israel. How will the clay talk to the potter and tell him what he's going to do? He says, tell us, we pray thee, who, for who this evil is upon us. What is your occupation, they asked Jonah? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which has made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them so. Then said they unto him, What shall we do to you? You know, they don't want to do anything bad to him. I mean, listen, I don't know about you, dude, but if I'm in the middle of a hurricane and all of a sudden I realize that you're the problem and if I throw you in the ocean, it's going to stop. I'm just saying I might be willing to throw you in the water. I mean, I love you, but dude, sometimes the storm is pretty much a mess. But by the grace of God, the Lord will give you grace to stay in the storm with the brother. Amen. Amen. Because they didn't give up on Jonah. I'm just, I'm just reading you a little portion. Even them guys didn't even know God. And they still didn't give up on Jonah. Yes. What shall we do to you so that the sea will be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake, this great tempest or storm is upon you. As in both these cases, David and Jonah, the people of God, are going in a direction that is against God's will. And in both these cases, God responds through judgment. In the case of Jonah, a literal storm that disrupts everything and everyone. And in our lives, sometimes spiritual storms that disrupt everything and everyone. In the story of Jonah, the offending agent had to be removed. In the story of David, he had to trust God through the results of the decision that he had made. Are you going to be able to trust God through the storm in the decisions that you had made? That was point number two. Your sin affects other people. You ready? This is point number three. Nobody else got you here but you and nobody else can get you out but him. Look at verse 13. First Chronicles yes. 21 verse 13. David said unto God, I am in a great Straight, meaning I'm between a rock and a hard spot. Yes, yes. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord, for very great are his mercies, but let me not fall into the hand of man. Nobody else got you here, David, but you. And he, you know what he knew? Nobody else is going to be able to get me out but him. See, there was no one else to blame for the predicament that he was in. 
David had made choices that transgressed the will of God. He had trusted in the strength of something else instead of trusting in the Lord. And this action in turn showed the people that their leader didn't really trust God when times got tough. God would not allow believers to use their mouths and say that they're Christians at the, and at the same time trust in other sources while expecting God to bless it. Don't expect God to bless that child of God. David knew that he had failed God and he knew that he was in a situation there where there would be trouble. But he was convinced that no matter how bad it got, his life could be trusted in the hands of God. And he chose to trust God in God's discipline. That's a word that's hard to swallow right there. But I'm telling you, it's a good word from the Lord. You and I have to learn to trust God in the midst of the chastening, in the midst of the discipline, even when it doesn't feel good. See, I'm not saying that all the circumstances will change. I'm not saying that he will move you to a new job, a new house. He's certainly not approving of us to choose things outside his will, but he will deliver us from the trap. And he will allow his grace and his mercy to enter our situation. And he will let his peace that surpasses understanding comfort our minds and heart if we will let it. Amen. Amen? Amen. See, I want you to know that there's a process to how this works. You ready? 1 Peter 5, 5 through 10. 1 Peter 5, 5 through 10. See, what we're talking about is the difference between pride and humility. If you want God to work in your life in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the trial, we've got to humble ourselves. That's right. See, pride's going to tell us to hold on to what to self. Pride's going to tell us not to humble self. Pride's going to tell us not to divulge the truth. Pride's going to tell us just to be tight-lipped. Pride's going to tell us not to come clean. Pride's going to tell us to hide it in the darkness. That's against the will of God. Right. Humility says, listen, I need help down here. And I'm going to humble myself under the presence of the Lord. And I'm going to come to him once again. You don't have to come to me. I'm not even saying you got to go to your wife. I'm saying you got to go to Jesus. I'm saying you got to get him down on your knees. And you got to say, Lord. show up God and I need you to do something in my life it says right here in verse 5 likewise you younger submit yourselves to the elder yes all of you be subject one to another and look at this be clothed with humility why because God resists the proud yes, he does. and gives grace to the humble humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time look at this Amen. casting all your care upon him. The word could be translated anxieties. Casting all your anxieties upon him. David could have started right here. Right? I mean, I'm just talking about right here, right now. He could have started with this scripture. I'm anxious, Lord. I'm looking at my enemy out there. He's growing every day. He's getting stronger right there. I'm going to cast all my anxieties on you, Lord. I'm going to try. David's the same one that wrote, He is my refuge and my strength. He is my strong tower. My God in Him shall I trust. But let me tell you something, too. You ain't going to write a song like that till you've been through something right, and the Lord right. has delivered you out. Amen? So if you're asking God to make you a stronger Christian... Hold on tight, buddy. Hold on tight. If you asking the Lord to make you look more like Jesus, I remember I prayed that one morning. Four o'clock in the morning, I was all spiritual, worshiping the Lord. Lord, make me look like Jesus. And then I swear, I, I'm, I'm not lying to you. This is what I felt like the Lord said. Did you see what they did to him? Do you see what they did to my son? Do you see the way they treated him? Come on. You understand what you're praying? Amen. Now, I mean, they, they ripped the beard out of his, out of his face. They spit on him. They blindfolded him. They thrust a crown of thorns on his head. They hit him in the head with a stick. They slapped him and they said, prophesy, son of man, who it is that, that, that strikes you. They laughed him. They ridiculed him. They stripped him of his clothing. They put a purple robe on him. Oh, king of the Jews. Then they hung him on a cross naked and everybody laughed and they scorned him. And the religious folks wagged their head walking by just like the world does today. Come on. God dare you go out there and tell somebody you love Jesus. I dare you tomorrow to go to work. And you, you need to practice it. You need to give it a shot, man. Give it the good old college try. The next time the door opens up. And let somebody know how much you love the Lord. And, and listen to me. See how they might respond. 
But that's what the world's still doing the same thing today to Jesus that they did back then. And they ridiculed him and they mocked him and they said, look at him. He said he was going to rebuild the temple. He was going to save the world. He can't even save his own self. Look at him all weak, hanging on that cross, blood dripping from him. He can't even get his own self off that cross. But on the third day, hallelujah. On the third day, he conquered death, hell, and the grave, child of God. David could have started right there. Cast your anxieties upon him because, listen, he cares for you. Look at verse 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking you. That's why I got a problem with seventh-day slumber, dude. <laughs> because I know the devil is a roaring lion and he's a deceiver. Yes. And, and the word, rest of the world might be not. And I'm not saying I got to figure it out. Look, I'm just this little boy from South Louisiana. But I know one thing, the devil disguises himself. Yes, he, does. he puts makeup on and he makes himself look like something he is not. Yes. And you going to name yourself supposed Christian band, a, a name that takes part of the word of God and a part of the word that says don't do it. And you're going to mingle the two together, dude. You do what you want with that, but I'm telling you right now, that's a red flag for me. Amen. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Did you know that you're not the only one going through something today? That's right. I mean, I don't say that to poke you in the eye. I say that with a spirit of love. Right. I say that to let you know. That if you're going through something, guess what? So is probably the guy on the side of you. Why? Because the devil is not a respecter of persons. And he wants to destroy you just like he wants to destroy me. Just like he wants to destroy the people I love. Just like he wants to destroy the people that you love. We're all going through something. We're all being afflicted. And we all have to hold. I granted, I realize that some people struggles worse than others. I get it. But listen. The right answer is not to be like, man, my, my trial is way worse than yours and, and to have a pity party. No, it's, it's time to get the weed whacker of grace and start like knocking down the weeds. Let the Lord prepare a way for us to get back towards him. Amen. Amen. He says, by G, uh, but the God of all grace who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, he will make you perfect, which means to be mature. He will establish you. He will strengthen you. Yeah. And he will settle you. Yeah. Four quick points from this text. You need to clothe yourself in humility and not rebellion. Mm -hmm. God moves towards humility. Number two, cast your worries and anxieties on the Lord. Trust him. He wants to deliver you. Number three, better stay awake. The devil wants to kill you. Resist him in the faith, not some other way. Number four, trust that the suffering is momentary. That's the word that Sabrina read. It's a temporary thing. It's already written down. The Lord is confirming his message. The season that you find yourself in today is only temporary. Amen. It's a momentary uh, situation of anguish. God wants to set you free. God knows what he's doing, child of God. That's right. That brings me to my last point. You ready? Point number four. What is the exit strategy to this mess? I can imagine in my mind the scene of this tragedy. The judgment of God has struck the land with a plague. 70,000 human bodies have died. And it appears that God isn't done. The reason I say that is because the angel of the Lord has his sword lifted in the air over Jerusalem. And the sword is the symbol of judgment. I imagine piles of dead bodies burning to prevent the spread of disease. The text doesn't say it. But the text says that David and the leaders were in sackcloth. If you can imagine the scene of a movie, you should be able to imagine the scene of this biblical text. I'm telling you that that's how they prevented the spread of disease. They would burn the bodies. Piles of bodies burning and smoldering, acrid smoke of human flesh in the air. They're clothed in sackcloth. Their skin is gray. Their hair is gray because the way that the Jewish people mourned whenever they had failed God or mourned death, they would take ashes and they would rub it over their body and in their hair and they would clothe themselves with something almost like a burlap sack and I can see them walking through the midst of the street, tears streaming down their eyes, wailing out pleading with God please God, stop the judgment, please God, I can't take a 
another moment. I can't take any more of this pain. And then all of a sudden, God says it's important. Sometimes the decisions we make result in a spiritual scene like this where everything in our life is falling apart and there seems to be no end in sight. Yes. But one thing that we need to understand is that God does not want to destroy His people. That's right. Amen. It's not the heart of God to destroy His people. No, that would be contrary to His plan. Instead, God wants to heal His people and make them great. Because when that happens, he receives glory. His name is broadcast on the earth and more people join the eternal family of God. So that's what the scene looks like. But listen, enter the name and property of Ornan into the story. You ready? We're about to talk about the exit strategy. It's always the same. Every week when you come to this church and you hear me preach, I'm going to tell you the exit strategy is the same. And let me tell you why. Because he, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it's one plan, one way. The answer is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He's not changing His mind. That's His plan. And if you look hard enough, you will find it in every story. I'm talking about Ornan the Jebusite. He had a piece of property and it was called a threshing floor. You want to know what Ornan's name means? Light perpetuated. The idea is, is that this, the light will not be extinguished. The light will continue. God has a plan to continue his light. That was his name. And that is God's plan. No matter how bad it hurts or feels, God doesn't want to extinguish, extinguish your light. He wants to make it burn brighter. Oh, give me scripture for that preacher. All right, you ready? Matthew chapter 12, verse 20. God doesn't want to snuff out your light. He wants to make it burn bright. Amen. Look at Matthew 12, 20. A bruised reed shall he not break. I'm talking about like a reed that you see in the swamp. It's tilted over a little bit. When Jesus walks through that swamp and he sees that reed tilted over, he's not like, you weak anyway, man. You ain't going to do the kingdom no good. Pop, I'm going to just break that. No, that's not how Jesus does. That's how the world might do you. You weak. You, you messing up the gene pool. We're going to take you out. That's what hunters think, right? Look at that little weak deer right there. We need to get that out the gene pool, man. We're going to build us up some. Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> Look at this. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench till he send forth judgment unto victory. What is a smoking flax? It's almost like a little piece of material that's just barely smoldering, tiny little wisp of smoke coming up. Can't even see the glow of the ember anymore. And what, what man would do is, look at this old weak smoking flax. I'm going to put that out right there. I'm going to beat you while you're down. I'm going to get you while you're weak. I'm going to kick you in the side when you're weak and you're feeling bad. I want to see. Because you know what the devil will do? The devil will use Christians to do that too. Right. Try to kick you when you're down. They don't even realize they're doing it. They're over there running their mug, being vessels of the enemy. Lord, forgive us. Jesus isn't going to quench a smoking flax. No, but you know what he's going to do? He's going to gently pick that up. You ever blew on fire before? You add a little oxygen to them little glow, and all of a sudden, the embers start to glow. See, God knows how to do it. That's the pneuma of the Spirit, the breath of God. God wants to blow on your embers, amen? He wants to cause your fire to burn brightly. God wants to do a turnaround in the midst of your life, amen? Ornan's name means light perpetuated, and his piece of property was a threshing floor upon which God instructed David to build an altar. See, threshing floors have great significance in the Word of God. You know what a threshing floor is for? Separation. Separation. That's exactly right. Look at three, Luke 3.17. We're talking New Testament now. The threshing floor of God. It said, talk, this is John the Baptist talking. He said, whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor and, get, and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. Now, this is old King James. So let me break it down for you. First of all, the fan is actually describing like a pitchfork. A threshing floor is a flat piece of property that has been flattened out so that the wind can hit it. Wheat is heavy 
chaff is light. It's kind of like the husk on a peanut. You know how when you crack a peanut open, it's got that skin on there and you kind of rub it and it flakes off. Wheat has that on it. It's got a little layer of chaff. And so you got this big old pile of wheat on top of this flat and threshing floor and you got like this shovel. It's almost like a pitchfork. It's not really like a fan. It's like a pitchfork. And they pick it, stick it in there and they sling it up in the air. And the wind takes the chaff and blows it away. And then by the time you're done threshing, the separation is taking place. You're left with wheat. The wheat is put into the garner. What does that mean? That's the storage house where the fruit of God goes because that's where the harvest of God goes. But the chaff is burned up in unquenchable fire. Listen, in the end days, God's wheat is his people and he's going to harvest that. But even in our personal lives, I need you to understand something. The threshing floor is the place where God is desiring to separate flesh from spirit, where he's desiring to separate sin from his holiness, where he's working in us and allowing things to take place, amen, so that those things can be revealed, so that they can be removed, amen, and judged with the fire of God. That's the purpose of the altar also. The altar is an instrument of death. The plan of God requires death. Look at Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's how God fixes sin. He kills it through the cross. The altar allowed the sacrifice to be judged by the fire of God. And that satisfied the holiness of God. And this was a foreshadowing of Jesus for when God would allow him to be a sacrifice for the sins of the world. Look at verse 26. We're back in first, uh, first Chronicles 21. Verse 26, David built there an altar unto the Lord and he offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and he called upon the Lord and he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of burnt offering. And look at this. And the Lord commanded the angel and he put up his sword again into the sheath. This is what changes the situation. It's called repentance. Yeah. It's called looking to the plan of God. It's called keeping your eyes focused on God's eternal plan, Amen. which is Jesus and what he did at the cross. This message isn't going to get any simpler than that. God has a plan. God has a way. And listen to me. The essence of the story is this. The problem is, is this. I'm talking about for daily living. Oh, preacher, you're preaching a message. I already know. I know Jesus died so that I could be forgiven of my sin before I go to heaven. You're missing it. Yep. Because listen to me. The same way you received him, so shall you continue to walk in him. Right. Listen, you got to die. Right. David didn't want to die. David wanted to live. Count my men. Show me how big my army is. Remind me of how strong I am. Remind me of how strong you are. You're missing it, David. You're not wanting to die. You're not wanting to die to be moved out the way to let God be exalted in your life. Jesus, the, G, the word, Galatians 2.20 says this. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but he liveth in me. And now this life I live, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself Amen. for me. Listen Amen. to me, child of God. I'm just going to tell you right now, I mean, I had a whole other set of scripture to go to, but I preached a long time. In Romans chapter 5, it talks about this. You've been justified by faith. The word justified, we don't teach this a lot in charismatic churches or full, full, full gospel churches. The Baptists teach it a lot. But, but listen to me. It's important that we understand this. The concept of justification is that Jesus took your guilt and sin yes. with him when he went to the cross. Yes. And when you put faith in, in Christ and what he did for you at the cross, you know what? God called you righteous. The enemy will never want you to believe that. He wants you to feel condemned. He wants you to feel guilty. I can't make you feel the truth of what I'm speaking right, right. now, but I'm speaking to you the truth of the living God. And if you will believe that, and continue to trust in that, you will begin to feel the weight of sin and condemnation and guilt lift off of you. And you will begin to feel the Holy Spirit fill you. And you will begin to feel the weed whacker of God go before you. And he will clear a path for you. And he will give you strength and order to enable you to walk. 
Amen. He said, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The peace of God moving and operating in our lives. It's a beautiful thing. Amen. Amen. But we got to trust God Amen. through the trial. We got to trust God even when the times are hard. Amen. Amen. 